Let's do it. Stevie, what's going on, man? I thought you were going to say, Stevie, we're back. Nah. <laughs> we are back. We're changing it up this week. <laughs> How you going, man? Good. Uh, good. We had a nice outing on the weekend. Yeah, First we experience of the new stadium. What did uh, you think of it? Unbelievable. It was um, quality. Unbelievable. That stadium. Um, just good to be back in Parramatta, obviously, uh, the lead up to the game. Just good to be back, seeing red and black everywhere. And then just walking into that stadium. Something different. Yeah, it was nice. Retta, how you doing, man? Ali, good. Yeah, good, good. You're at the good game as well. Yeah, you it was good. Good uh, feel. Uh, stadium was good. Um, it's nice to see football's coming back. So Yeah, I'm I think excited. everyone was just excited. Yeah. It yeah. yeah. felt like the old days. Yeah. 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 yeah, the the march was on. The uh, flares yeah. were out. It was yeah. controlled. It was good. It was really good. Good atmosphere. Good vibe. Mm -hmm. Even the Leeds fans turned up. Huh? Yeah, mm. didn't expect so many fans. I was close to the Leeds section, and it actually sounded like I was in an English stadium. Mm. Like yeah, because when stuff. they so scored, it, yeah. it was loud. It was loud for that thing, but they were quiet throughout most mm. of the game. I think mean, the Wanderers fans were making more noise throughout mm. the game. Yep. But no, overall, it, it was decent. Mm. It was um, good. Good. Good stadium. Really. It was a really good stadium. That's what we need more of those type of stadiums. In 100%. Australia. 100%. I expected probably a bit better of a turnout. Though. Yeah, yeah so right. I think it's the top. I think it was quite empty. Yeah, yeah. on that side. Um, but overall, I think it was good. It was good. Yeah, it was good. Good. first game back. Yeah. And then Stevie, you got to see your your <laughs> idol in front of you, Bielsa. Bielsa. Yeah, that was awesome. We were like, we could have reached out and touched yeah. him. Yeah. <laughs> it was, what a character he was. Yeah, it was good. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, obviously, he has a massive pedigree uh, for where he's been and the respect that he has in the football world. So to see him up close um, was awesome. Was it was doing good. his thing as well. Doing Just his focused, thing, sitting on his bucket. Yeah. 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 So. Squatting down the whole time. Yeah. Uh, quite animated. It was yeah, good. It was good. It was good. It was interesting. It was a good game. I don't know if it was a good game, but mm. we got a lead shirt too. We got the, the Leeds t shirts. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right at the end. Yeah, they threw into the crowd. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, it was really good because we were really close, even though you weren't like where you could see stuff. Because mm -hmm. you, you go to the other stadiums, yeah. like front row, you're stuck on the floor. Yeah. That's right. Like yeah. here, you're kind of still it's elevated. very elevated. If you actually see up the top, yeah, it's it was very, like very elevated. It was very so European it, style where, yeah. you know, you're closer to the pitch, even mm -hmm. though you're up high. Mm. Yeah. Um, that was good. Yeah. It was good outing. So today, boys, we're going to talk about player development, player pathways, training, because mm -hmm. I think a lot of parents and stuff have been asking us about to cover this kind of aspect of yep. the game. Mm -hmm. uh, Steve, you're probably the most experienced person in this field. Yeah. So what, what, do, what do you think, you know, player development's out in the country and, you know, training and all that kind of stuff and where we could take it, you know, what's out there? Um. I think I think we've made strides in certain aspects of the game in the last couple of years, and then I think we've lost things that we were particularly good at before. Um, so if you look at it now, we've spoken about this before. When national curriculum's come in; it's given that more structure um, around the training. It's probably to a fault now that it's the same kind of sessions that the players are doing all over. So it's the passing practice, it's the possession game, it's then the positioning game, then it's the game training, uh, and it's. It's almost turning players into robots. You're seeing players have a slightly better understanding of games now than what potentially they did a couple of years ago, so maybe five, ten years ago. Um, but the, the the lack of focus on technique, I think, is starting to become evident now. So the one players that are coming through now, the 19, 20-year-olds, are the ones that first experienced this national curriculum. Uh, and now that they're coming through, I think the technical level across the country is dropping. I think it's getting worse. Yeah. Um, How do you think we... like? improve it or how do the players improve it themselves because i think to a point you kind of have to take it in your own hands don't you yeah 100 percent. so if you're thinking that you're going to go to your club environment and that's going to give you everything that you need to be a professional player then you you're mistaken it's not going to be so the focus in those team environments is obviously on the team and the team performing and things like that which it should be from 15 16 17 and 18 but we're seeing that at 8 9 10 11 so we obviously come across a bulk of players from different clubs different areas different levels of playing in those younger age groups and it's interesting to speak to them about the kind of things that they do at their training sessions and to find that out and to find how structured say an under nine team is working on things that they didn't do well on the weekend there would be a million things that an under nine's team didn't do well on a weekend um <coughs> so they're talking about their structure and those, those kind of things at nine years old um which is a bit how's it going yeah i, I mean i second to, to what steve says and that just goes to show where our Youth teams have come in the last, say, three to four years. Uh, we haven't qualified for a youth uh, World Cup in a very long time. Like Just if the you 17s see, now, that's it. Yeah, if you look at countries, yeah. like even some of the ones that are coming up, like Thailand, even Vietnam, look at their technical mm -hmm. aspects. Um, and compared to ours, I mean, we're lacking in a lot of fields. Yeah. Um, 
we, we are obviously more dominant in terms of the physical presence. Like, I mean, Keanu, we had him here and he admitted, you know, he said that physically we are stronger than them. But then that's when it goes to the next step where we're like, all right, we're versing the Japanese countries or the Middle Eastern or then trying to compete in the World Cup. It's it's more technical. And like Steve said, I think with the national curriculum, we're too focused on where to stand, where to go. Um, and, and that we kind of forgot about, you know, the basics of how to pass the ball or mm-hmm. how to use your left foot when you're a right foot or how do you... You know, or vice versa. So, it's yeah. I mean, I I totally agree with Steve. I think in that field, I think we're kind of struggling, um, and it really depends on where we're going to go forward yeah. as a nation. If you look at it, everything that's associated with winning a game is a technique. So, scoring a goal, so striking the ball is a technique based mm. thing. Um, playing that through ball in for somebody to finish or whatever it is, or even defending and reading that and being able to tackle effectively and to stop goals and those yeah. kind of things are all technical aspects that have obviously have that decision-making element a part of them. But at the end of the day, they're all techniques. So there's a lack of folks on that. Then we wonder why we're not creating those players that have that killer instinct to be able to change games mm-hmm. by themselves and to be able to turn a game on its head because there's the zero focus on that. So yep. the, the emphasis of training is on like the team and how can the team win, but it's taking away from the the fact that your players actually need to have the technical ability to be able to execute those situations mm. to then be able to, to, to yeah. win games. I think what we got it wrong was we too f- we focused too much on uh, on tactics and, and that comes second after, you know, your yeah. technical but abilities. I, yeah, and I still don't think we've improved well in the mm. tactics. I think that structure, as we said, we spoke about before where the national curriculum has brought that structure yeah. in for so a, a coach can pick up a book and then this is how you run a session. Yeah. And from, from that point of view, it's probably been good for them. But I think it... I think it's done some positive things, like I said, in those terms, but yeah. I think it's been detrimental yeah, in a big 100%. aspect. That that technical aspect is is lost, and you speak to players from SAP, even club to a degree, um, all the way through to, like we talk to the boys that are in the A-League, like what are you doing in the session, and there's zero emphasis on technique. So a perfect example is one of the A-League clubs last year had a three-month preseason and had potentially two or three, I think it was, finishing sessions for their forwards in, in that time period. Yeah. Uh-huh. And then their players, players are expected to go out onto the field then in perform like yeah. when it actually matters. Then they're, from, they're, not, yeah. they're not performing, they're not scoring goals, so not you're on the bench and then it's the next person. Yeah. Like, it's just from crazy. from a From an A-League's perspective, I mean, I do understand that it might be hard for them to try to, you know, really invest in, in some time. Um, I think it's, it's below that, like more of the youth ages. I'm someone that played in the curriculum at the time. Like, I mean, I went through it. Wasn't the most gifted pl- player, but I mean, I saw what it was like. It was just so technical. I mean, sorry, so tactical. Emphasize where to stand or where to do this or how mm-hmm. to do that. And there was no time invested in our personal development. I remember yeah. preseason, we'd be running for three months straight, yeah. and then you get to a trial game, and it's all the way in January. And it's hot, you know. And then it comes to the season, you're just doing a few bits here and there. Yeah. So it's just more of that bracket. Like the, I think I don't know if Steve, you're gonna agree with me. So maybe. I don't know, nine to sixteen is the is the growth period. Maybe yeah. a bit younger than sixteen, but yeah. I think that's where we we, we for those wholesale off. changes, and that's yeah. where the emphasis on technique needs to be. But mm. I kind of disagree with the A League thing. I think if anybody has the time to do it, yeah, it's those ones that are in a full time environment yeah. that that have those opportunities to do it. And something we'll touch on more when we speak about deficiencies that we see in pros. Mm. But <clears throat> there definitely needs to be that emphasis even at that level to have a look at so the boys we talk to that have come back from <laughs> Europe massively that that's a focus over there and that's something they mm-hmm. have to do themselves to make sure they stay on the ball and stay like up to date with all the other players that are there but you see it here like how hard would it be to put 30 minutes out of your sessions or not even out of your sessions allocate an extra 30 minutes for those boys that day mm-hmm. to get a uh, hundred thousand repetitions in of finishing the ball it's going to be beneficial at the end of the day for the individual yeah, which is then going to benefit benefit mm. the team you know mm. what i mean and we see that we know that's not the case <coughs> at, at the majority of clubs that we that we know of um it could potentially be happening at other clubs but yeah so i think that's a big uh, a big issue that we have yeah well you you touched up on the technique and since i've kind of come in like not obviously being a coach or a good player at any level mm-hmm. but you know seeing it like you, you see in training sessions you know someone hitting the top being like three four times then seeing you work and then you're correcting their formation just because the, the technique just because they were hitting at top bins before to me I thought yeah if you're getting on target you're hitting it properly mm-hmm. but seeing that no that's not the case yeah yeah and the technique is tri- flawed tremendously on so many players where they're not striking yeah 100 percent. and often often the time it's the the outcome is like a it's almost a lie like it's a, like a false truth yeah. that i can hit a ball absolutely wrong 
and like it might go top bins out of mm. nowhere but that doesn't mean that if i do that a hundred times and that's going to be effective and that's what we look to do and that's what our players need to be able to do is to be able to effectively say just for shooting for example effectively strike the ball 99 times out of 100 and that, that needs to become second nature and it's not and we see that from the the grassroots all the way to the professional game and some of the biggest names of the profession it's not consistent yeah and i think that's where the more players i think you like you just said it's a lie and they're kind of they mm -hmm. hide behind that lie because they're not passing the ball properly. It's mm -hmm. bouncing, you know, they're yeah. not hitting it hard enough. They're not doing. Yeah. And when you work with players, you know, you're telling them adjust your hips, move your legs, step forward, step mm -hmm. back. Yeah. And it's stuff that when you see these players have no idea that this mm -hmm. is what they're doing. This is their pattern. You know, yeah. when you say dribble, drop low, mm -hmm. you know, bend your knees, like stuff like this, a lot of these guys yeah. don't and, actually know. Yeah. And it's, but it, 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 and it is difficult to go because obviously I was coaching as, as a field coach, a team coach, sorry for say, what was it 10 15 years or something before we started to move in here and my whole outlook on players and development and thing that obviously massive change is something that we're seeing for hundreds of hours a month you know what i mean so it becomes something that you anybody if they're in here coaching as often as what we do would start to improve as a coach and would start to see the same consistency and the same patterns that when this happens this is the outcome regardless of the level of the player so if this part of the technique's off then regardless if i'm a pro player or i'm a younger player then the technique's going to be off mm -hmm. um so it just comes through that practice and that emphasis and then seeing the connections and then understanding the different components that make up a technique and then isolating those to see how they fit into the bigger picture of the technique and then obviously um, showing the whole technique in the whole. And it's a lot, it's a thing that why we've been so successful is we've added that to people's games and people say regardless of the level, they can come in. There's not one player that's come in and we've worked with a lot of big names that I go, you know what, your technique's spot on. Like we don't even need to address it. So mm -hmm. it's every part, obviously players have different levels of deficiencies, but Every pro player that we've had in has had deficiencies in their first touch, deficiencies in their passing, deficiencies in their striking, and then deficiencies in their dribbling to one degree or another. And the biggest one that stood out for me, and we see this a lot with the younger boys, so those ones that are just under that um, A-League level, the amount yeah, of them the that can't strike a ball correctly yeah, like is astounding for me, and it's something that I can't believe that these players are at that level and they can't strike a ball properly. Imagine if they could strike a ball properly. You know what I mean? Yeah. Imagine if that first touch was more effective. 100%. Imagine if we were developing these players that could do these things on a, on a more regular basis. Yeah. We're going to be a million times more effective as a nation. Hundred yeah. percent, I agree to that. And I mean, the, the technique is like a habit, right? So you practice mm -hmm. it, and then you start yep. getting used to it. So I guess when you the, the younger you are. And you invest that time, of course, into the kids that, you know, how to strike a ball, how to pass a ball, mm -hmm. how to do these things. I think it's very important. And, I mean, these are like the basics of a kid that stands out. You'll know when a kid stands out if he's mm -hmm. got all those aspects covered. Yeah. I wouldn't say, you know. Yeah. Oh, but it, it yeah. is in 100%, like, you, it can be built and developed at that younger age, and it is. Mm -hmm. But it still needs to be refined at those older yeah. ages, and it still needs to be something that's ever sort. So we see it all the time boys will come in here so pros will come in here in their off season then we see them again through yeah. the season and the off season yeah. and like the the longer it's been since they've been in here so the longer they've been focusing quick on, question that, on that it, yeah. it dropped the, the yeah. level of technique has dropped i've got a quick question in that regard do you feel like it's it's harder to uh, say work with a a pro than work with a with a younger person like in terms of like development and, and in what way so is it easier to get across you know or get them to fulfill that certain technique to get it right do you feel like it's a bit harder or do you think harder with the, the pro younger or harder you with the younger yeah is it is it You're saying which yeah. one which one do you reckon is easier it's harder with the younger one yeah with, with the older players it's easier to refine like we're not reinventing the wheel where we are with younger ones mm. so normally with a younger player they'll have <clears throat> say if there's five components that make up a technique they'll yeah. probably be missing four of those where if mm. a pro player they're only missing one of those so it's easier to correct that and then to show them and then they'll try that and then they'll see that it works and that's effective and then they'll pick that up the problem is when they go back to their club environment they're not focusing on these things it's focusing on the tactics it's the fitness yeah. it's all these other things that gets neglected and once you're not doing something regardless of what is anything in life you're not doing it often enough then it's going to have a detriment and it's going to start to decline and that's what the problem is and that's why these things need to be like implemented into these elite environments so that these kind of things can like players can get better at it. and something that we need as a nation to start thinking about across the board is how can we improve our technique? And as you spoke about, you touched on, which is a perfect example, is Asia. So if we start comparing ourselves to Europe, it's probably a bit too left field. But if we start comparing it to Asia, where we compete in and where we're at, we're not even close to the technical ability of yeah. those countries. And, and we're it, starting not even the biggest countries, yeah. though, like even the smaller ones, as you yeah. said. The smaller ones, I mean, they're catching up. If you see Vietnam nowadays and mm -hmm. Thailand and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, even Cambodia with what Honda's invested into their national team, mm -hmm. um, it's very, tech sorry, very 
technical. Um, and I think we're starting to really fall behind and we're seeing it within our soccer roots team, mm -hmm. which is more and about pace well. going forward, yep. strength. And we understand that we're a very physical country and we can adapt to that. But then it's like that next step. Oh, do we just want to be champions of age or do we want to be someone that competes in the World yeah. Cup that can, you know... But I think if things yeah. keep going the way that we aren't even going to be champions of Asia. That's yeah. what I mean. Like, you... You can't be champions of Asia when Jap Japan are so technical. Mm -hmm. Korea, you know, Korea, and yeah. even the Middle Eastern countries are coming up. You know, mm -hmm. Qatar won the Asian champions. Um, yeah. and, Asian and if Cup. you saw them compete in the the Copa America, they gave Argentina a very hard time, um, and, and a few other nations in South America, and they did compete with them technically as well, believe it or not. So, just goes to show when we're going to compete, and I think it's in two years or one year. I, I don't really know exactly, but it's, it's going to be interesting year. to see. Is it next year? Yeah, yeah it'll be very interesting to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but I think that, that's it. Like you talk about the technical thing is we're not like football now is popular because it's super technical. You see all the best teams in the world, the technical, all the mm. players are technical. But like Steve said, we're not driving that in. We're not working on our players. We're not developing our players. There's not that underlying platform where we're like, okay, you're good. Tactically, you're very good. You understand everything, but you need to start practicing this. You need yeah. to start doing that. And it also comes down to, so the technique obviously affects the outcomes. We spoke about scoring goals, striking, doing all those kind of things. But it also affects decision-making, awareness, and all those things. So you think about the brain as a whole, the brain can only focus on so many things at once. Right, so if I'm having to think as balls traveling to me, how am I going to receive this ball? Like, and I'm constantly thinking about that. Where does the touch need to be? Those kind of things. Then my brain capacity is focused on that rather than where's the space? Where am I supposed to be? Where are the defenders and those? Like, if I'm not confident, it's not natural to be able to receive a ball or to pass a ball or whatever. That's taking up a lot of my brain capacity. So my ability to problem solve and that on the run is seriously like affected. So it's about having that technical ability. That's <coughs> natural and it only comes through autonomy and by through a lot of practice and repetition so that technique becomes natural so now the brain's not thinking about how am i going to receive the ball the brain's thinking about those decisions and then the next thing and you see the best players in the world that technique is so natural and that they don't have to think about it that it's just all those decision making decision making decision making but we're not at that point that we have players that are on that technical mm -hmm. ability so if you looked across our national teams there's no disrespect how many of those players would you say are technical players you know what i mean if you look there might be five or something like there and if you compare that to like how many of those are world-class technicians? There wouldn't be any. Like, yeah. like I said, it's no disrespect. Yeah. It's just being real <clears throat> about where we're at. Yeah. Um, and, and that's why the technique is so important. And yeah. the fact that it's neglected is, is worrying. I guess that also comes back down to imagine if our national curriculum, I mean, when was it introduced? It's been yeah. ages. Okay. Off, say, yeah. say, for example, that, nat say yeah. that national curriculum had specifically focused on technical aspects mm -hmm in those you know from the ages of nine to say 15 16 whatever it might be and then from there learn about the the, the tactics that's involved mm -hmm. of football and understanding the game because the older you get the more you're going to understand but i feel like these features should be addressed when you're young yeah it's very very important and i think we're doing it the opposite yeah. of because the yeah be. the, the 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 sap age so the nine to twelves or nine to thirteen whatever it is at the moment yeah uh, is focused on supposed to be focused on technique skills it's yeah, still in skills the game it's supposed to be focused yeah. on skills but even still if you look at the casual curriculum it's not teaching you how to strike a ball how to receive a ball how to pass a ball whatever it is it's teaching you how to structure a session so once again yeah. it's not giving the coaches the information and we spoke about this before on podcasts ages ago like striking a ball there's only so many different ways that you can strike a ball so how have we not got together as a country and shared that information with every single coach in the country. Say, this is what you should be looking for when somebody's striking a ball. This is what you should be looking for when somebody's passing a ball, when they're dribbling, when they're receiving or whatever it is. Because there's only so many different ways to do each of those things. And it's not my opinion is you should do it like this and someone else's opinion do it like this. How you do it is how you do it. So that's what needs to be implemented across the country and needs to be given to our grassroots coaches and we support about this. If we can build a better foundation at those levels, then it makes it easy for the next coaches to then refine that. And then as you start moving forward, we've got a bigger base of, of technique that we're able to build from. Yeah. Are those type of like resources available to coaches? Is there any, or is it just kind of I don't, research yourself type of thing? I, I think it's more like a YouTube video, like something we'll put a video up or somebody else will put a video up. So, this is how you do it. This is how you do it. This is how, but um, I haven't stumbled across it lots of places that go into detail about this is the step this is the step this is the step this is the step yeah, the, the federation isn't providing that no kind of that doesn't come, not come from the governing bodies wow that's i suppose that's where the problem lies isn't it essentially because yeah. especially at grassroots you got all these you know parent mm -hmm. coaches and stuff like yeah. that who do what they can mm -hmm. but if you're not equipping them like you said with the knowledge and you yeah. know where it's a video or mm -hmm. it's a document no, it's, or it's a, been good that it's taught like a, a mum and dad can pick up the national curriculum for the younger ones and then be able to structure a session for those things yeah. it's awesome 
but I still think <coughs> a lot more could be done at that level so and at all levels, even the it. NPL. Like, if you look at how we're there, and it'd be interesting to say, like, like I said, we've been fortunate, it's something that we see every day, so it's something we've been able to get better at and, and, and to start to master. But, like, if you put showed a clip of, say, somebody striking the ball, and then you say, like, what were the deficiencies? What steps were right here? What steps were wrong? So, what components of that technique were correct? Which ones were incorrect? Mm. How many coaches would actually be able to answer it? 100%. I think football's just like any other sport, really. Any, like, I mean, if you want to get into tennis, you're going to learn how to hit the ball first, mm. not yeah. where to stand. Mm-hmm. Um, same thing with swimming, you're going to learn how to free your arms. For example, it's yeah. just like any other sport. I think yeah. we're, we're just doing it the opposite. Yeah. I mean, we're doing it completely the other way around. And some of these developed countries, England, Germany, you see that they focus. Mm-hmm. I mean, even Brazil, maybe they don't have the best, I would say, um, academies in there, out there. But, you know, they play on a futsal pitch and they learn themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we lack that. We're just too busy telling them about the mm-hmm. about what's on the textbook, yeah. Yeah, and then yeah. We, there, yeah, and then the sessions are stopped and talked yep. to them about. S- yeah. Stop a session for 10 minutes, you stay in here, now you come back. It's, yeah. it's a waste of time. Yeah. 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 Okay. So where does like, do you think like you talk about NPL like you brought it up? You know these guys what they try and train twice a week. Mm. Three, it's more three, now. Three, three yeah. no more. Three. I think it depends on the clubs, now. Yeah, yeah, some are but, four. Like, should they be adding like a session in just for these guys to be working on technique? Like, if you're, I think it depends like, how you look at it uh, from a, from a coach's perspective. What's what's going to be in for a first grade coach, right? Mm. What's his incentive to? Focus a whole season or focus a preseason solely on, on technical. Right? Zero. I'm not saying like he's not going to have anything. Zero. It's to have an extra session a week. To yeah. Yeah. But so even at that level, yeah. and this, this is the problem that it comes down to. So yeah. the the thinking needs to come higher than this clubbing. So if I'm a coach, I coach under 14 and pure one. Mm. I could spend my whole time trying to improve my players, get them better, try to improve their technique. But you're going to have things. the best results. We don't have the best results. What happens to me if I don't get the best results? You're out. So, I get sacked. That's right, yeah. And that's the problem. No so when a coach weighs it up, I think this is what I should be doing with my players and this will be most beneficial for the, in the long run. Don't get me wrong, some coaches are like this, mm. but this is what we need to do to be successful for <coughs> now. 99 times out of 100, they're going to choose what they need to do to be ses- successful for now yes. for these bunch of players. That's so true. at the end of the day, it helps them to be able to c- keep a job. It helps the club to be more successful and then hopefully attract better players. The one part of that that misses out is the players it's the players that aren't that's, getting that's the development yeah. that they need and which is then stifling their development which once mm. it goes to the end of the train it's it's hurting our national teams and it's hurting. yeah for sure that's why that's why i mean we need to we need to change the way we're doing things and start on that specific aspect of technical mm-hmm. abilities when they're younger yeah so then that way we, you know when it gets to stuff where you know your job's on the line it's mm-hmm. different um yep. You know, NPL clubs and you know any any club, I guess in general, they're not going to invest too much time in in some of the no. technical aspects. Like you said, they're going to be focused on the results. Mm-hmm. There's no incentive for them. Then that comes down to those specific age groups that were raised in that certain generation. For example, it's really up to them to focus on on the the bits that they they aren't um, doing well in or they're deficient in. Um, let's just say, for example, I know we said it, spoke about it a bit on the podcast where. Like someone like Keanu back four or five years ago wouldn't have the balls to even take a shot realistically. Mm-hmm. Um, now he's coming in and he's been doing it for a few years, coming to the session. I know you worked very hard with him, Steve. So seeing him now doing it more often and he scored some two decent goals last year outside the box, one mm-hmm. in the bottom corner and one up the top right. Um, so, I mean, yeah, it's really up to them to, to progress, yeah. Yeah. But I suppose, it, yeah. It's gonna ha- like I said, it's, it's above that MPL level that the yeah. thinking needs to be and there needs to be some way. Like four thinking clubs, will allocate an extra session maybe some yeah. do don't get me wrong not across every single club maybe some yeah. will that one's a technique based session obviously at the younger ages I think a lot of clubs do mm. but it's continuing that as they start to go through and then progressing it like what you're working on at 9 needs to be a lot more in depth as it gets to 12 and 13 and 14 and that but it doesn't it almost stops like when it gets to 12 and then there's no progression of those techniques as they start to move through so players regress in their technical ability as they play through yeah, yeah. you look I, at you look at sorry Ali, you could look at johan croft you know his book and he talk how many hours is it should a player spend on a board it's, it's some ridiculous amount of hours yeah i think that was more about the hours that <clears> he put in like in the street and where he learned how to play yeah football and and, like and that. that's like that's from johan croft the mm-hmm. i mean he's we call him you know i don't know the god of football for example but that's just a perfect example to show that yeah you got to spend time on doing these little mm-hmm. things that can make you a better player in the future yeah, yeah. I, I think the, the other part i was going to add to that is where do parents need to start taking accountability for their child's development because but the problem is the parents 
the vast majority of them never played football and never had anything to do with football, so they don't have the knowledge. So these, then they are guided by either other parents around them that say this is what we do or, or this is what it is. So it's very hard for a, a parent to to a degree to take control of that they're guided by the club so they're guided and you see a lot of the time they're misguided by clubs and things like that or they're misguided by academies or whatever it might be that they're not they're not 100 percent sure so it's about people being honest and legit and then giving out that information that's what we're trying to do here uh, and that's what we, we've always tried to do is giving that knowledge out for parents so then they can make educated decisions rather than uneducated decisions with what they're doing it's very difficult like if that's like if if your son decided he wanted to play cricket or something yeah. like how ed how educated are you in cricket so yeah. how would you know if this was good for him or this wasn't you don't you know what i mean so and that's that's the problem and i think that's because football's not our culture if you look at you go to europe or those kind of countries mm. where it's established the dad was the granddad was the great granddad and like the whole family's yeah. football so they Even have the that person on the street your neighbor might know about it would, ha would know yeah. about it you know what i mean whereas here we don't so a lot of the vast majority of parents that have come <clears> through might have never had anything to do with football before so it's very difficult for them to make educated decisions and to, to take responsibility for that they might say my son can't kick a ball, so then they go to a place like us, or they go to somewhere else in the hope, and it's, it's in the hope that these people might know what they're talking about, and they might be able to help my son. Yeah. And so, unfortunately, a lot of the time, it's they don't know how to help them. And yeah. Yeah. So let's let's progress over to like individual training, and you know, mm -hmm. so where the players do it themselves, or they go to a facility like this, or join mm -hmm. an academy, or whatever. Yeah. How beneficial do you think it is to players? It's vital. Like, there's no question of a doubt, like we, how we open. If you're relying on your club to be the sole developer of you as a footballer and think they're going to take you to where you need to be, you're dreaming. Like, it's not going to happen. So even, like, for ones that are training, say, if I train my club three times a week, I train in an academy once a week, there's still another three days in the week you need to be doing something yourself to be doing that, whether it's stuff that you've worked on at your team training that you, you want to improve or it's stuff that you worked at your academy that you learned. You need to be doing <coughs> something every day to improve yourself and that's not going to be seven days a week in the academy or seven days a week at your club. So that comes in where you need to be doing those things and you need to be working on stuff all the time. Yeah, and do you think just a lot of these players are kind of lazy because it's not like obviously a lot of families don't have the the means to pay for to a private coach. I wouldn't say some. I would say the majority. Everybody yeah. wants it. All right, but nobody wants to work for it. Yeah, and then they just don't go outside. Like kids back in the day, I suppose when we grew up, you're outside most of the time. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, everyone's on their computers. There's a lot iPads, more to do. There's a lot more that's buying for their time, um, and that does have an impact on on the quality of players that we're we're developing. But yeah, it, yeah, there's so many different elements to it. But yeah, I definitely think there are players out there that want it, but there's not enough players out there in this country at the moment that want to put the work in that will then challenge the next person to work harder, next person to work harder, next person to work harder, which then raises everybody's stand and that doesn't happen. Yeah. You find the elite will go through either based off natural ability or that work rate that gets them there eventually, but that competition for spots when it gets to that next level isn't there. And that's the 100%. problem that we should I, I agree with you. Um, touching on the, the academies, academies aspect, I, I mean... Not here to bash out any academies as such, but I think that um, a lot of parents are also investing money money in the wrong way, uh, being marketed in in such a I don't know how would you call it I don't, I don't want to call it a lie, but I don't know just fake promises. I think that's very important as a parent. You might have this hope and you invest so much money and in, and in time into an academy. Um, and you're paying like I don't know wh how do they pay how do they work these academies they'll pay like three grand a year three grand for a whole year are. and uh, you know and then they get to go to some travels and travel around the world and England or whatever yeah but those are like extra like tours yeah I understand extra, extra but it's a promise that grand. promises the issue um, promises the issue um, and then that's that's where it starts off where the parents make the wrong decisions um, it's really important to ask a question um, consult with the right people. Um, you don't need to ask one person for a second advice. Continuously ask it, um, and always go off record. See see who they work with. Um, what have they done? What have they achieved? Uh, these are very important things. Like you've got a, you've got to cross check and make sure that you're you're making the right choice. Yeah, but the but the problem with that even as well, even if you went to say the best academy, so the yeah. best academy out there there, it's still in a a club in like a club type environment. So it's still in a team environment. There's still like groups of players, even though the focus there might be on technique. Yeah. The amount of feedback that that individual can receive throughout that session is limited. And limited. I know that myself That's correct. as a coach yeah. when I'm at school and I'm coaching, the amount of feedback that you can give to each player is a lot less. Yeah. Yeah. Um, then obviously if you're doing a one-on-one, -on -one, but mm. even if you're two-on-one or three-on-one or, or whatever it might be in those smaller smaller groups, and it's just that refining of the technique. So we'll have players that will come in here, for example, that will come in 
say once a month so they come in for that once a month we give them stuff to work on while they're away and then it's a reassessment when they come back in has it improved has it declined and then it's building on it for that it's it's just getting that solid technical foundation and it's something that like i said we don't see in a lot of the players from the grassroots all the way through where they're competent in all areas of their technique yeah. Yeah, and like even just this last a-league off season was a, a perfect example like one of the boys we were working on, he couldn't strike the ball through with his left foot by pointing his toe down. So every time he struck, his toe came up, which was then affecting the rotation on the ball, was then affecting the accuracy and things like that. Another one was different, could strike with his left foot, but couldn't curl with their left foot. So these are pro players that are, are very, very elite um, that have these deficiencies in their game at that age that we're trying to fix. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, one of the Matildas couldn't curl the ball, so we would spend the whole time working on curling the mm. ball with her. And these are little things that could be developed and could be shown at a younger age, but they're not and they're players that are having to, to refine that. So they're playing in the professional game and they're not confident to strike the ball on their left foot. Yeah. Like think about the limited amount of time you have in an A-league game, how fast it is, that now all of a sudden I'm not confident here so I have to find a way to get it back on my right foot or change that decision that I would have made if I was comfortable with that. Yeah. Um, but do, do, do you think a lot of these um, like private facilities don't have the best players interest or they don't actually have the capabilities to improve player techniques because they're popping up left right and center like i sit my facebook my instagram ads mm. and nowadays it's just like private coaching private coaching all these random people now it's also like mm. ex-pros that are doing it now yeah. i'm gonna try to be as diplomatic as i can with this but obviously we're only limited by what we can see of other people say what they share on social media or what they post up or whatever it is so it's hard to get a big grasp of the exact quality of the other academies out there but from the little snippets that you see um you can see like for example like serious technical faults within their clips that they're putting up like serious technical faults that are a basic thing the kids stepping too early the contact on the ball's too high whatever it might be these are things that can be corrected on the runs you're not even stopping it and saying it these are things that can be corrected on the run they're not corrected at all like at all these things aren't spoken about that so this player is going in practicing bad technique bad technique bad technique and like there's no improvement in it like it's just the bad technique and that things like that that we see which is concerning that parents are paying this money for these kind of things when you can see like with, with easy things yeah. that you could fix aren't being cut yeah. whether that's done off the clip or whatever it is but yeah like there's yeah you see it yeah like i said you always look at um like you mentioned so the videos they're doing um, another thing the plays they've worked with is very important to see if these plays have become successful mm -hmm. uh, especially on a on a professional standard to see you know if, if, if a player was lacking you know shooting the ball whatever it might be or executing um the shot um these things are very important and also word of mouth to have a good reputation um th these three things are very important and vital for parents to decide but i think that's also it can be kind of lied to as well they can be kind of elaborated oh i've worked here and they did work there but it doesn't actually mm. mean they were good or they're doing the right message because i know there's a few private coaches that have decent coaching gigs mm -hmm. but they're not necessarily good coaches you know they are the ones that you know steve was talking about that, that have those they don't pick up on the technical faults of a player they allow it they congratulate a player you know you see these videos they're going great job great job because the guy here in the bottom left before he you know ran through 15 cones and jumped over five hurdles but is it the parents are getting bamboozled by the elaborate drills that these mm. people are doing and they think oh this is it like looks you know, intense. agility yeah That's it looks, the word intense it looks intense it's yeah. agility look look how hard this is but if something's hard and you're not doing it properly you're not doing it mm. like That's what you say like yeah you're executing bad technique at high speed isn't making you a better player all it is yeah. making you better at executing bad technique at high speed um, and that's the thing, like we've said all, all along, obviously we're a business and we're here to make money, but there's bigger things for me. And like we said, it's about leaving an impact on, on, on football and making things better. So like we spoke about it a lot, this is a massive football market like there. So it's not, we're not worried that other places pop up and things like that. And we're very confident in what we do that we know we can help players. And we've seen the evidence as we've gone through. It's more, when you see these things, it's more... I don't know if sadness is the word, but just feeling sorry for the player that wants to do extra work and wants to get it's better and isn't getting that feedback and the parents doing it like well-meaning, trying to do the right thing, give their son the extra, extra training. And then whether it's they've been fooled by the elaborate drills or these people have done this or whatever it might be. And it's just sad to see that. And that's 
not that it's our job to try to educate all these people, but we want to try to get as much information out there as we can for coaches, for parents, for players, just to try to make an impact and, and go through. Like we've been asked a million times, like how do you feel about like 99% of players is now using boards in their sessions? Like if you look back maybe two years ago, the amount of t- coaches that would use boards in their session would have been, you could count them on one hand. Now nearly every person has some kind of rebound board like in some capacity. So the answer I always give to them, I think it's mad. Like, I think it's awesome that, that people are doing it. Boards improve individual training, allow you more repetition and those kind of things. So the fact that other people are doing isn't something that we look at or we, like, say people are copying us or whatever. It's good. Like, if that's something that we've helped other coaches to see the value in that to add to their players, then happy days. We're happy about that. Yeah, I think that that's the other problem is coaches are too, oh, I don't want to give away my drill. I don't want to give away this. Mm. Rather than sharing it and trying to help players, they're mm-hmm. more concerned about themselves. Yeah and they're you know what they have because they apparently have a secret weapon mm-hmm. that you know no other yeah. coach has in the world no one has a secret weapon yeah. the, you know, no I mean, that, that's what i mean it's, it's that's like not, that. that's not true come on let's like yeah, but that, i don't know who says that but yeah it's ridiculous it's, it's not that's their logic that's their yeah. thinking is the fact that you know that they've got something that no mm. one else has so they don't want to share so, it yeah, it's, it's but so, it's yeah. like okay if that's the case then where is where is your success where is the stories that you're going to tell me yeah. that yeah you know you develop the next like name look at the or best something. look at the best guardiola he shares yeah. his, he shares Everything his theory all the time you know he's yeah. on the whatever channel it is in england bt sports and then you've got um uh bielsa for example he's got a whole book it's like mm-hmm. a textbook he's talking mm-hmm. about methods and Steve's got the book yeah for example and then there's a lot of coaches Johan Kroff is one he shared yeah. his his philosophy out there everywhere, everywhere. and it's really up to you to adapt to that that's yeah. up to yeah. the and coach and that's something we've taken on board yeah. as well like if you went through all of our videos all of our posts that you could literally go out and train yourself like yeah. you wouldn't need us you wouldn't need those kind of things if you could follow those feedbacks um, that we give in the videos and the, the, the structure that we say to each of the techniques you coach yourself and you could improve yourself as you go through yeah and I think that's where a lot of these players are like lazy I don't, and you said if you really want it you'll go out there and make it work mm-hmm. you'll yeah. find stuff it doesn't matter if you got the money or not like you, mm-hmm. if you want it you can make it you happen can get it. <laughs> everyone yeah. within metropolitan areas has access to parks has access to fields that they can get to and those kind of things like or has a backyard or a front yard or a, i used to kick in the street at the front yeah. of the gutters as a rebounder when i was a kid um so there's there's, there's always ways to improve but yeah like i said it, it's a very multifaceted problem but Talking about, like I said, the other academies, I think a lot of them are well-meaning. Um, you obviously hear the stories about the ones that aren't, and, and that comes around how true the stories you hear are or, or whatever. And I think everyone wants to do a good job and does care about their players, whether it's just the lack of knowledge that they potentially don't have. You see a lot of young ones popping up now, uh, and I'm just thinking, like, how much do you know? And even ones that were ex-pros, and this isn't a dig, but ones that were ex-pros before, played a handful of games in the A-League or whatever it might be, and are now like promoting to train like see what it takes to make the league but if you've played three or four games in a league like you didn't really make it in the a league or whatever it might be um so it's just about yeah it's like <coughs> it's an easy market and that's the problem like everyone yeah. thinks it's a quick fish and it's an easy job and it, it's to that there's so much more to it like i said i've been coaching for 15 years now i've got my masters of sports coaching i paid my dues worked with good coaches coming through i was coaching a youth team senior team since i was 21 like all the way through put in the work and then it was still only in the last couple of years that I've been fortunate to be here to be able to see like how much of a difference like the individual technique makes in games yeah and just on top of that how many hours a week do you work coaching Steve do I work coaching a yeah. week um, I'm trying to get off the field a little bit more obviously but I've got other general, stuff just to put in perspective do. for people that I do how much minimum you... minimum seven hours a day on the field so 35 yeah. hours a week that'd be minimum and yeah. that's that's coaching that's on the field that's yeah, not that's in sessions yeah. with players working with that yeah. yeah in the holidays and in the off season that we've just gone through it's got a little bit more quiet now but there was days where i was doing 10 plus sessions a day so yeah, yeah i was clocking up 50 hours a week just on the field yeah and i think that's where people you know need to understand like a lot of these coaches they coach for three hours a week yeah mm. you know they do yeah. a, two mornings a week or they'll do 10 hours a week yeah you're in there up yeah. to 50 hours a week and, and like, like i said it's not like big noting us or putting a head it's like anything if you did anything for the amount of hours that we do and seen like the different things as much as what we do then you're going to get better at it in any walk of life if you have that much time to to dedicate to anything then you're going to get better at it. and it's just we've been fortunate that's been football and we get to work with the the bulk amount of players that 
with that we get to work with that it's been able to accelerate like where we're at as a business and, and then we've seen that it's been successful from that so it's not it's no secret it's been hard work putting the effort in getting on the field doing, yeah, doing, doing the hard work and, and that's all it is I'm not sitting in the office all the boys are out there and all of a sudden I'm a super coach I'm busting my bum every day putting the hours in yeah so. yeah I think that's where a lot of people need to realize it's, it's experience mm-hmm. I suppose it comes down to yeah they're not all private coaching places have experience mm-hmm. yeah. um, and it takes a lot more than just liking football and played football that means you can coach yeah i think that's where a lot of people have that misconception is i want to be a coach yeah. i can go get my license it doesn't take much to get a license i no, can get you a job need a license to be a no coach. but you know but yeah. the, you, uh, suddenly i feel yeah. you know validated because i have my c license b license a license whatever yeah but how many hours did you put in yeah. you know um, it's like a pilot they have to put in yeah. a ton of hours before they can actually get Trust a license yeah yeah, yeah. But it, yeah, and that's not even the privacy. That's in the MPL as well. How many hours have these coaches put in before, um, and they're given access to the so, the so-called elite players, players. That, that come through? Um, but yeah, the the thing that obviously the, these are businesses nowadays for people, and the selling point, which which kills me. And I think I sometimes think something we need to do better, or we need to promote more, or whatever it is. But then on the other front, it's like I don't think we need to like the bulk amount of pros that we work with like regularly and that even now that they like off season the girls are starting to roll back through and we've still got like boys from overseas and that we put the post up here and there sometimes there's a story but like the majority of the ones that we work with you wouldn't see and that um and it's like people go oh, i haven't seen this person for a while where have they been like they're in yesterday bro you just don't you don't see it we're just that busy working with our players that we don't and you see these players best academy in sydney or best coach in the world or or this like it's it, it and parents will see that. Well, it must be true then. You know what I mean? This person's going out there and says the best academy and then these people start to go there. And that's, like I said, it's something, not something that I've toiled with to say that we need to boast more than what we do. But I think the I think the proof's in the pudding. Like if you continually work with top level players and you must be doing something right, whether it's us or somebody else or, or whatever it is. Um, so they're things parents should base it off. Like if you could go to the same place where pros train, like... Why wouldn't you why go? Why wouldn't you go? Yeah, and that's what... That, that's the understanding or you go somewhere where they've never worked with pros at that elite level how are they going to tell you what it takes to be a pro like i've never been a pro but i've worked with enough of them now mm. to say these are the habits they have this is the the technical ability that they're at at this level these are the ones that are a little bit higher on that level or whatever it is um so yeah 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 i think that's that's the thing is for parents not to be fooled by advertising and marketing and promotions mm-hmm. and stuff like that go check it out yep. see what it is see how your child adapts to it see if it's actually like you said, child, let's see if it's actually improving your, your yep. child. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, like I said, it's hard for a parent and I feel, I do fully feel for them. Like, how do, how do you know? Like, yeah. if I have no, no if I had to go watch a cricket coach now and they one guy, guy was putting a session on and one wasn't, and one was further, so similar to what we do, fully focused on technique. So it's nothing flash, it's like basic. And then you see one that's throwing two balls in the air Juggling. and hitting the ball and doing like something, like, you know what Somersault. I mean? Like, you go, well, that looks a bit. Yes, but look at that. That looks great. Yeah, yeah, maybe that's what's for my son. So it's hard. Like, it's just about getting that education out there and and, and even just trying it. Try this one. Try that one. See how it works. What benefits did did, did your players have? So we we work with a lot of players. So we spe- like we specifically work individually. So it's ninety nine percent of what we do. We do offer a few group sessions, but we specifically work. So we have a lot of players that do train at other academies that come in here for their individual sessions and, and things like that, which is neither here nor there for us like players are coming to help so we're going to give them their time that they train somewhere else is up to them if that's their prerogative to do then it, it's, it doesn't affect our relationship with them and it doesn't bother but you see on a lot on the other side that once these places find out they're coming to train with us and it becomes an issue then it's pressure put on parents and things like that and it's and, and I'm fortunate that's like the, the side effect of the private coaching market like people think they're taking from me this is my player I did this yeah. you'll never hear us say regardless of how many hours we put into a player that was my player I did that or, 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 or whatever it is we contributed to it and it might be a certain technique if they couldn't do that before and now they can do it and they pull it off in a game we're not going to go out and say this is what we did but we'll know ourselves and the players yeah. will know and I, I agree messages. to that anyone that claims that he um, or you know they, they turn that player into professional players or 
was all crap. Was you can say, you know, yeah. you can contribute it, you helped him out, there's things mm. you worked on, but yeah. So at least you did it from when the kid was a five. No, like I said, the <laughs> only way in the world yeah. you could ever claim a player if you were the only coach they ever had before they went pro. That's right. That's so the they, they forget yeah. their clubs, forget their pathways, forget their professional yeah. coaches. They yeah. all they all they all contribute somehow, some way. Yeah. Um and especially when you get to the professional level, the elite level, um, it's it start get, starts getting more intense. But we're talking about, you know, the the, the other stuff that you can work on with yourself. Mm -hmm. um, you can't kind of claim a player just by saying, you no, know, you worked with him for a couple of years. And I said, that's something that we would never do. You yeah. see it a lot, but it's something we, mm. we wouldn't do. I don't know. Do you think we should yeah. put it out there more who we work with? Or? No, I think it's good. I think, and don't forget, a lot of players like the discretion. They don't want, you know, yeah. firstly, half of them aren't allowed to train. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So yeah. it's, we, you know, mm. yes, the thing is you offer that discretion to players. Mm -hmm. If they want to put in the extra work, you know, it's a fully monitored environment. You know, if they just want to come in and work on their dribbling, or if they just want to come and work on their shooting for mm -hmm. an yeah. hour. Yeah, and we get a lot of that. This is specifically what I want. Normally, how we work with players from down up is the first session is more of a general session where we have a look and assess that player and see. So I had a boy in this morning, for example, and that good dribbler, decent first touch, short passing was good, longer passing was average, and striking was average. So, and then that's a little feedback now. So when I'm planning sessions with that player now, then obviously we still work on the dribbling, we still work on the touch and the short passing, but then you start to put more emphasis on why is those longer passing and striking breaking down and what can we do to build a solid, solid, solid or I don't even think it's a word, a, a better foundation for that player then moving forward. And that's how we, we structure our sessions. And it's the same with the pros. Like pros will come in and say, I want to do like a finishing session, but it still starts off as a general session first to get an analysis. And then you go, yeah, I know you want to work on this, bro. And I can see that that's deficient, but have you thought about this and this and this as well? Because if you could add those to your games and you can become a better player. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Um, where, where do you think players go from here? Because you, you, you look at like, you know, you, you obviously you're 18, 19, your MPL, there's only certain handful of professional contracts in Australia. Where do you go? Like, <laughs> where is it? And Reda, you'd, you'd have more experience on this as well. I, I always think that... Because you can't always of, make it in that. Yeah. You can you can always have, have the ultimate goal to be a professional footballer, but then again, it always comes down to your luck and how things work out for you at the end of the day. Um, some players are very unfortunate. Some People players, don't agree with that luck. I 100% agree with it. I, I think, no... It, uh, I don't know how they don't agree. Jason Mourinho is big. Like, there's no such thing as luck. You can create luck. I think mm. you can do it. Um, you know, some players miss out due to injury, wrong decisions, moving to wrong clubs. Um, some people decide to go to England um, and then go for that that unrealistic, and I want to call it unrealistic, um, thought or, uh, you know, the thing that they have in mind that they're going to play in, the, in one of those MP, uh, EPL clubs. Um, it really depends. depends on how it works out. Um, but necessarily, I don't think all of them think they're going to be EPL. But some of them will go, oh, I might make a career yeah, in League Two, championship and stuff. Yeah, yeah League I mean, Two, League One still makes more money than here. I mean, I, I, Steve, I mean, Steve, we're talking just a little bit earlier about some players that they had the opportunities to do really well here in the country, and then they would leave for six months, three months, and then they come back and then go again for three six months. It's like you literally wasted a lot of time. Um, and then, especially at the age when it comes to 18, 19, 20 is when they start stressing out. Yeah. Um, they start thinking, what should I do? You know, there might be a fringe A-League player or there might be a play in the youth league. And I know a lot of uh, kids that are in that position. Um, and it's really up to them and depends on where where, where it's going to go for them. Some players, for example, we've got um, a player, for example, Steve's worked on very hard, went overseas, he's come back, now he's got an opportunity for a, for an A-League club. That works out, that works out for him. Um, he had he had the choice of also staying here. Maybe nothing would have worked out for him. So yeah, I, I believe in luck. I think luck's a part of it. But also you got to be wise and making the right decision and, and forgetting all the emotions. Um, I think that's where a lot of kids get it wrong. Yeah, but you're... do you think it's just not because you say that, right? But yeah. what if you're okay? You're fringe. You're NYL. Mm. Whatever. Now you're 21. Mm. You don't have an alien contract. You don't have an alien contract, but I don't think it's the end of it. To be honest. Yeah, but I don't Realistic, think playing yeah. NPL for the rest of your career is yep. really being a pro yep. footballer yep. 100%, so why isn't but then it's it just for them the... to go overseas and play in england yeah. or play in romania or play mm. in bulgaria or wherever and have a career as a professional i think i think if, if you're up to that stage where nyl is not for you um and and you are well you finished nyl now yeah. you're 21 yeah. no, no nyl yeah. team wants you so what do you do so that? what do you do <laughs> uh, it really depends on how you want to do it some players like to go to mpl and keep working 
Um, and what, having the opportunity, you, there's well, been what's a few. The likelihood of you the likelihood is very small. Yeah. I mean, if you look at, for example, Western Sydney Wanderers and the amount of players they have in that academy, we they, they, it's impossible for them to take in all those kids. Yeah, of course. Um, again, that that's Steve's a big hate of the the Southwest team, and I think that's going to probably fill in a bit of the youth, the youth gap there we have. Um, but still, that's still not enough because you still got Mariners, you still got Sydney FC. Yeah, of youth, course, of course, I mean? it's it's definitely not enough. It depends on where they want to go. Some. Uh, some players decide to go in the MPL, and and most of the if we look at Matt Miller, he's an ex NYO A League player. If you look at, I'm trying to think who were the, some of the ones that came up, um, I mean, oh, forget Kim Sober from Melbourne Victory, but he's one that really progressed and and worked hard in the in the A League, um, or oh, sorry in the MPL in Victoria. So it really depends. There's no one answer to that. I know there's um, no answer, but do you think like even Steve? Do you think these players should be gambling or just going overseas? I think yeah, if you're starting to get to the the old ages, you're starting to get to 21, and you haven't yeah, made, that's had a nibble mean. somewhere, yeah. and you haven't, it's mm. starting to get a little bit on. It's going to get harder to get opportunities overseas, and mm. your real one opportunity then, if you're that age, is to try to break into the A League and then try to get it all. But then, it, then it comes down to what's your definition of making it. <clears throat> so, is making it playing professionally in Australia or playing in the Premier League, La Liga, whatever, it is, or is making it getting paid to play football professionally? Yeah, yeah but that, that's, that's for me. That's that's my ex- my definition would be to be paid as a professional footballer and you you don't have a job till you're like 35 yeah. and retire yeah yeah and, and you're the, living comfortably yeah and that's something that i wouldn't say my perspective changed but it's something that's probably expanded my view on that obviously we've been fortunate enough even lately a lot of boys coming through that are playing in like different places like random most of yeah i was in mm. he's playing in lebanon and there's other boys one that's going to play in dubai um other ones that are playing in lower divisions in, in um europe and things like that that these are viable options for players here in Australia. Obviously, it's easier for some than others. If you have a European passport, obviously it opens a lot more doors in Europe yep. than what it does yeah. if you can't get a European passport. Um, but there's lots of opportunities. And like I said, if we if we look at where the development stage is here in Australia, and I'm thinking, as we said, am I going to stay here? Is my team going to help me to be a better player? Am I going to get what I need there? If you have the opportunity to go overseas and it, it's a realistic option for you to potentially go, there's been nibbles or whatever, I'd be looking to go overseas. Yeah. What do you think? So you're, you're anti going overseas. I'm not anti, no, no. You, I, know, I, you I, made I this comment the last week, it was. No, I think it was, me. It, it was when it was... You go, how can you make it overseas if you can't make it in Australia? I'm talking about the bigger clubs and the bigger prospect of making it in a big league. You're not. What are the? Ch- I mean, the, the, you can't say it's impossible, but the chances are slim. Um, I, will, I will tell you, the there's a bunch of Socceroos yep. that never played in the A League. There would be Bailey Wright never played A League. Jackson yeah, Irvine never right. played A League. I agree. I agree. There's like but you eight, can't nine compla- of them. Yeah, okay. I agree with that, but, but you can't compare them to when Tony Popovich was in his prime, or you can't compare him to Tim Cale. Oh, Tim Cale was a bit of a different one. Port Ocon in his prime, he was. He was quality player. Some of the players that we had in the, I guess, the 2006 generation, a little bit before them, they all started in this NSL comp. Yeah. And then they progressed. Uh, and back then, they knew their worth. They were bought. So, like, poor Oakland, when he was bought, he was he was worth something. For him to go over there, he was something big. It, it's not small. Um, I, I'm not anti-overseas. I get the idea of it, especially, like Steve mentioned, where you go into some of these leagues where you think that, all right, you can get a – Progression, but I'm I'm more all for. Oh, it's, it's a bit of a funny one. It depends on the circumstance of the player. Everyone's different. You can't see it in one certain area. But if if it's not working out for you, of course, go look at op- uh, other opportunities, whether that's overseas or yeah. Then country. that's what I mean. I think yeah. that's the encouragement needs to be there. That if you're not in the fringes of A League, mm. w- of course, you try your luck. Pro, try your luck overseas. Well, you have no other choice. That's but that's the point I'm trying to make you have no other choice mm-hmm. you're not going to make it in the A-League let's yep. see how many players from MPL go to A-League yeah it's it's very slim I, I, I tend to agree with you slim. Yeah. it's very slim and they don't even look at them that's a mm. shameful thing because there are some quality players there, there. Yeah. I think there's some quality, Absolute quality I think there's some players in MPL that are much better than some A-League players mm-hmm. yeah. and I'm talking Out like the... levels and step beyond that some players say nah that's impossible and I've heard a lot of A-League players actually tell me that's not true. I'm like, no, nah, mate, it is true. Mm-hmm. But the difference is you work on a more intense level. You work in a professional environment. And when they come and trial for you, they're not used to that professional yeah. environment. But if you give them that time, like we saw Kim Sober, he's play, he played in the African Cup of Nations and he's versing some big teams in Africa. Um, he's a perfect example. You look at other examples, even 
Um, for example, Majok. I mean, Majok was at Mount Druitt, ended up at, at Western Sydney Wanderers, um, even though he was a part of the academy setup. Matt Miller, um, believe it or not, Matt Miller, everyone told him that he would never become a professional footballer. And he look at him, he was, it. and he absolutely yeah. killed it. And he, I think he, I don't know if he was the highest assisted player um, or the second, I, I don't know, for a right back. Like, just goes to show that if you, if your luck is there, your luck is there. But at the same time, you've, each player is different. If, if it's not working out for you, even on the NPL stage, of course, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, th- then overseas might be a good opportunity for you. Because I think there's there's a lot of opportunities, especially if you've got a, like Steve said, if you've got a European mm. passport, like, Oh you yeah, you're living. Yeah, you're living good. You should be looking over there be because good. yeah, hundred um, percent. There's okay. a lot of like smaller countries that will pay big dollars for mm-hmm. you know good players because mm-hmm. yeah, they don't have them in their country. I mean, we, we, I just mentioned that earlier. Um, you know, we, we got a kid here, and uh, he there was no chances of any A League club even thinking about him. Went overseas, now he's back. Now he's as a trialist at a club. So it just goes to show that sometimes, yeah, going overseas can benefit you. Yeah. Um, it can make you even more of a professional person. You lived away from the family, for example, and you experienced what it's like mm-hmm. to be just a, a footballer. Yeah. Um, that that can be beneficial. Um, although some, and there's other examples where players go overseas so many times that they've missed out on so much football. Um, and then it's that hope of go trial for big clubs and then they fail. Um, and they end up here and it's just like, oh, yeah, I was at under, under 30s at Main City for six no, months. Well, see, I completely sure. understand that yeah. one. Like, yeah. that for me, yeah. Like, you should be going where you're actually going to get an opportunity and where mm. it's going to actually develop you. But I think it's that step. You're it's, 21, 22. Yeah. What do you, you can't, do? You can't perf- perfect a certain uh, decision, I think. You can try your best to study it and think about it and look into it. Um, but... There's no one answer to that, and if anyone tells you go overseas completely or tells you to stay in the A League, just think about both both sides of it. And yeah, go. if you're in the A League, yeah. like you're there, like unless yeah. you get dropped or. And if something. you're in the A League, you'll be there for a long time. <laughs> yeah, you just go on the washing machine. <laughs> yeah, you go into that recycling, and that's the yeah. problem as well. I feel like A League clubs should start investing. Is in- it is it happening now? Because so many clubs sack so many players, where and not all of them have ended up in um A League teams. So is that? Cycle kind of broken now a bit. No, nah, it's still there. It's still there. What happened to all there. those Brisbane players? Fourteen Brisbane players that got released. They're still there. They've been distributed across a few clubs. Oh. Um, see, that's the that's the thing. I feel like clubs should also um, invest in the MPL a bit more. So sending yeah. people out there. I don't Which see it as an issue. Yeah. I don't see it an issue at all if a club like Central Coast was to go send the scout in. In Victoria, or yeah. hire someone there. You're not gonna pay them too many, mu- too much money, but just go have a look. Give me your best players. Let me have a look at them. Are they better than what I got? Even if it comes to Wellington Phoenix, yeah. For a club that can't uh, financially support, um, you know, getting some big name players or international players, that's a good opportunity for them. But there's no point in going to take a, a reject from another club. Sorry to a lot of players, but taking rejects um, from one club to another. Um, we've got to break that system. There's players out there that deserve spots. Um, and yeah, I think I think it's I think clubs got to work on it, um, and also um, I think NPL clubs should be selling their players as well. That's a problem. I think NPL clubs try to hang tight onto their players, mm-hmm. um, but I think they should be also marketing and promoting their players to go forward and future. Because let's look at, for example, Matty Ryan and how much Blacktown City made out of him. Um, and Matty Ryan was a perfect example of how Blacktown City used to be, where they push players um, into A League clubs, and Blacktown City make money off transfer market right now. Um, so. Look, I think I think they both sides uh, be responsibility of player promotion as well, as well as agents as well. Yeah, yeah this is actually another point you just touched there. Is mm. A friend of mine, one of his, one of the kids he grew up with yeah. that he played football with, he was at Reading yeah. FC in England, and he was there. He was on the fringes, so he would train with Reading during the week. On the game days, he would go play with like one of the fifth, sixth tier like mm-hmm. teams. Then back during the week, he did that for a couple of years. Moved up in the Reading ranks, became a full international, got signed by Chelsea. But like during that earlier stages, train with the team, play somewhere else. Train with the team. Why don't we do that? Why aren't they training with the thing, playing in the NPL with for another team? Like, why isn't stuff like that? Why aren't we like forward thinking enough to go, yeah, let's loan players to the NPL. Mm. Let's invest some I, of those players, that quality in there. Because mm. if, if they go in the NPL and they can't make it and they're struggling, why wouldn't you go sign some guy that's actually 
doing well in the NPL. Yeah, for sure. No, I totally agree with you. Um, but then again, uh, for an A League club, are you saying? Wait, sorry to. Are you saying an A League club to loan out a player to NPL? Yeah. I don't see that as an issue at all. Yeah. I think that's a very good, uh, very good thing. But uh, would the player accept it? No, hell no. He would not accept that at all. I think if the structure's set up and you've got more players, mm-hmm. like for the, for the clubs have more players, why wouldn't you accept it? You're not going to get a go. So yeah, they, you got to play. Still, they st- I, I don't know. I see a lot of professional players try to hang on, especially in this country, as best as they can, um, especially where they at. But when you're um, hanging on for dear life, you're done. How we're, how we're how long country, are the biggest yeah, this A-League is the problem, contracts? But we're a contract two with, years. Yeah, we're, we're a country. Yeah, hundred percent. I agree with you. But we're a country that has barely any clubs, so everyone's just trying to stay put as best as they can. Everyone, um, MPL clubs, MPL players are trying to impress. A League players are trying to do their best to stay in, even if that's it. they're in the the you know the washing machine, whatever. The theory is, um, and then you got NYO players and, and younger than that all trying to aspire. And there's only 10 clubs, it's average of 25 per club, like it's yeah, I less. Know that. So, I know, that's what I mean. Like, so uh, again, uh, it's so it's moral of the story is you don't have a future with this country. As no, a it's not that you do, but I think it's just coming to realistically it depends on, on the decision. Well, isn't that realistically it that you don't yeah. really have a chance to become uh, what's your chance to become professional football in Australia? One percent. Anyway, yeah. yeah. Slim anywhere, but especially I think in Australia. Look, I'm, I'm talking about players that actually yeah. have like the skill. I'm not talking about some guy who's just filling up like yeah. an MPL slot. For for an advanced country. Yeah, MPL three. For an advanced country, I think like it's quite ridiculous the amount of clubs we have and where we're at. Yeah, it's quite very ridiculous where we're at. Look at some even countries like advanced Canada. What, but advanced in society or advanced in football? Advanced in society, everything. If what you look at advanced? Canada, for example. <laughs> Compare Canada football to Australian football. I think Australia, we love our football more than Canadians probably love their football. But they have more clubs than us. They've got a better structure. Realistically, this is... Really, they only just launched their first league. Their first league, I know. Yeah. But look how many clubs are in that league. It's like and eight. Is it eight? Yeah. Okay, but they've got two in the MLS as well. Yeah. I thought it was more. And that was before no, it was like this eight. one. No, the Canadian Premier League got launched this year. Okay, so they've had, had like I think... Six or eight teams. They had a system which was similar to NSL though, <laughs> before. And then that's why they scrapped it and they brought in this one. Yeah, well, yeah. the old one, but the yeah, new yeah. one's only got yeah. a few teams. But even if you look at them as a, as a nation, they they they're pushing and they're starting more clubs. That's eight. Wait till they. I, I think they're going for another third MLS license. And yeah, but th- they, that's the thing. But when you got like you can tap into the MLS, yo, why yeah. not, man? Like, of course, yeah. Toronto, Montreal, the big clubs in the MLS. I think we're getting a bit off topic. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, <laughs> I think that, anything else you want to talk about, Steve? Yeah, just to lead off. So just for the young players, not to lead off. Sorry, to finish off. So just speaking about like the as as we said we touched on it before like no pro player that comes in here um, like is technically competent not I wouldn't say competent like technically rounded where flawless. everything flawless yeah, yeah sorry flawless is what I was looking at. like are, are technically flawless and then the 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 common traits obviously like striking the ball is a big one that we see from the grassroots through the pros players struggle to strike the ball um, like if you can strike a ball effectively and this is no disrespect but even as a female player like if you can strike the ball properly you're going to score lots of goals you're going to be um more marketable for, for for clubs and things like that like you can almost base a career off that being able to strike the ball effectively but even at any level so we see a lot of the players can't strike the ball well off both feet a lot obviously off their non-dominant foot but they're all open and this is the common trait that all these pros that we work with a they've for starters, they've gone to try to put more effort into themselves to to come into a place like this or somewhere else to improve themselves. But it's that openness to improve. And this is what I see with a lot of the young players today. And I think we mentioned it on the podcast a while ago where I'll work with certain players at a certain place and then get no respect off the younger players there that play at whatever yeah. A-League academy and then come in and work with the first team players and it's total respect because they know not even know not even to do with that we, we know what we're talking about they want to hear the information and then put it in the paint themselves if it works it works if it doesn't then they just wouldn't come back like it, yeah. it, it's as simple as that so it's openness to to implementing things into your game and knowing even if I'm the best player in my under 14 to come the absolute best by a country mile I've still got lots of areas in my game that I need to improve on that I need to work on um so just trying to wrap everything up. So it's that openness, and that, and that's what we see with the pros. They're all open. They all want to become better. They all, all want to add something to our games. Like I said, one of the boys that had a massive season last year and just coming in working on just one aspect of his game and you know, drive the ball with their left foot. Um, so those are the important things. In, re- in regards to advice that parents should be looking for in clubs and players should be looking at in clubs, it's somewhere that's looking at that balance. So 
and, and once again it comes down to it's hard because parents aren't educated so they're not sure but like how does this club f- play football how are their trainings made up and it's about trying to get that information to go there are all of their sessions 101 national curriculum so it's going to be the passing practice position and things like that or is there an emphasis on technique at those younger ages or even to those older ages and they're the things that you need to try to find that balance of being a uh, respectable club or, or perceived to be respectable one of the better clubs but also one that's actually going to help you to become the best player that you can be yeah yeah i think i'll definitely yeah doing that research like you just said mm-hmm. and trying to make that educated guess without having all the knowledge yep. um, yeah which is tough yeah it know. is definitely tough but yeah yeah like you said ask as many questions as you can do as much research as you can yeah and and just anyone that's listening we're approachable as well so whether you don't work with us you don't train here or whatever or you have no intention you're not in the country you're not in the state whatever it might be we're open the amount of messages we get every day we're just going through and writing to people that i've never met never heard of don't know and just trying to give feedback that's what we hear obviously we're busy and there's times that we can't get back to you straight away or we might not be able to get back to you but we try as hard as we can to answer questions that people may have so please feel free if you're listening now and you have any questions something that we didn't touch on or whatever it might be flick a message to the page or something like that either our facebook or our instagram and then i'll make sure that i get back to you um with whatever it is that you have yeah sounds good all right we'll probably wrap it up there mm-hmm. um so we see you boys next week next week let's do it have a good week see you.